Even though the lever was still there. Hey, our uh, producers, the sports doctor, Colin McLaughlin, co-hosts today, the Hall of Famer, Matt Miller, and New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap. Now you know what John Gilstrap feels like <laughs> as his <laughs> chair sinks <laughs> gradually. That was pretty wild. Your, yours just went more quickly. I, I thought I hit the elevator button. I was <laughs> going down. In studio, and I mean in studio, Senate President Craig Blair. Pull that mic closer to you, sir, if you don't mind. Good morning. Man, you look good. New suit and tie? No, no. These are old. The buttons are missing <laughs> off parts of it. Uh, pretty hard on suits nowadays. Uh, but, um, yeah, I've got things to do here in Berkeley County today, so I'm in uniform. That's awesome. I didn't even know you were coming in studio. I thought you were doing it by phone. Oh, I thought I told you I was going to do studio. You may have. Uh, well, whatever. Yeah, thanks whatever. for having well, me on this morning. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Uh, uh, hey, September revenue numbers rebounded nicely, and uh, it seems like the pace is back to have a pretty strong year. Okay, the, the rebound's not the proper word for mm-hmm. it. Uh, the, the, the months of July and August are always down a little bit in for the manipulating uh, of the numbers of moving things around and shifting. So, but uh, for, for the the year at this point in time, and so it's a quarter. Uh, we've got three months in. We're two hundred thirty-four million, almost two hundred thirty-five million dollars above revenue estimates. And that's a big deal. I think that you can multiply that by four and tell you about where we're going to come out at. Close to a billion. It's going to be close to a billion dollars. And you have to keep in mind that of the, when it comes to the personal income tax, we've reduced that 21.25%. So off the paychecks, the withholdings is 21.25% mm-hmm. less. And so when it comes to the personal income tax, though, of it's exceeding – by a hundred and eleven million dollars of so that means that we've lowered the tax and people more people are working it's my understanding less than nine thousand people are drawing unemployment in the state of west virginia right now so that's a big deal too Mm -hmm. of and but people being back to work it makes all the difference and when you got more people participating and that means greater revenues are coming in from severance tax that roller coaster uh, right now we're down 13 million dollars for the year now same amount of coal or actually it's a little bit more is being mined same way for the natural gas but the prices are down and that's the way the severance tax is assessed is on the pricing and so but the production of it is actually up so that's good for the state of west virginia but because of the work that we've done of on managing our budgets and everything, we are less of in a situation where we need the severance tax. When the severance tax is good, then we're able to put resources into infrastructure, capital improvements. You can't use that tax of the severance tax for something like tax reduction. That'll get you in trouble every time, and so we've been we've been very very good at being able to manage that part of it. Uh, the consumer sales tax, it's up twelve million dollars, of above estimates, mm-hmm. of and so we're in pretty good shape for that. Rainy day fund, almost one point two billion in the rainy day fund. That's more than what I'd prefer to have in there, uh, but when we were in the special session. That's what we ended up negotiating out and doing. And keep in mind, there's another $400 million tucked away into a personal income tax reserve fund so that if we would get into trouble of with our, our tax reductions, that that is there to help smooth that side of it out. And that's separate from the rainy day fund. That that is separate from the rainy day fund, and it is collecting interest. So if you, if you drew from that, it would not affect your bond rating. No. And and you can actually draw from the rainy day fund. We do it every year, and that doesn't affect the bond rating. What will affect the bond ratings is if you would actually go below 17%. And this is where we've got almost 25% in the rainy day fund. Of your budget. Uh, of the budget compared yeah. to the general revenue budget. And that's a little bit too much. We could actually use that money for more capital expenditures in the state that have a return on the investment. Uh, but that that is not the case at this point in time for that. And it doesn't hurt anything by being there. But again, do you want to invest in yourselves in such a way that you grow the economy for the state of West Virginia? And what we're doing is working. Of and so and for your listeners, I predict that we'll hit the trigger for another ten percent personal income tax reduction, 
of w- when we get to that point. So that is all good news. Our pensions are in awesome. Uh, situation of we're I think we're in the top 10 in the country for our pension systems and that all affects economic development no business will want to come Illinois is a prime example nobody wants to go there and locate a new business or anything like that because they feel like wait a minute if I go there this pension debt's looming you're going to tax me more to pay for that and that hurts for the job creation of to, in states like Illinois. This is one of the things that were taken off the table in the state of West Virginia. And that began in 1992, but we've stayed the course. And if everything goes right, before 2034, we will have 100% funded pension systems throughout the state at all levels. And far as I'm concerned, the, the lowest one is 79 point something. And 80% funded is fully funded because that to the, of 100% funded pension system is everybody that's in there, if they retired right then and there, it would take all that. Which doesn't happen. Which doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, and so we're in great shape for the, from that standpoint on that. I've rattled through the numbers. Now you can ask all the questions that you would like. All right, very good. John? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just reading a report over the weekend of, uh, I guess it was the West Virginia Chamber of Commerce had the various gubernatorial candidates um, in, in discussion with each other. And Secretary of State Mac Warner said, and I'm, I'm just reading this, do we really have a state budget surplus in the billions when West Virginia leads the nation in drug overdoses, almost two times as much as any other state? When certain portions of the public, uh, portions of the state lack public water and sewer systems, when we lack infrastructure to attract residential and commercial developments, and he goes on from there. I read it. Yeah. Okay. Any comment? <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Uh, I don't think Mac fully understands how we're do- going by doing the budgeting process. And what happens is, is that if you allocate all your perceived revenues, you're going to spend everything. And I'm the author of the Flatline Budget five years ago, and I got told it was a dumb idea. Yes. Are we keeping the, the the revenue numbers artificially suppressed? You betcha. And what happens with that is it squeezes out efficiencies. When you squeeze the agencies out here, what happens is it, it, the problems within that agency fester up. But when you have these excess revenues, then you're able to go back and target Instead of working with an axe, you're work, working with the scalpel, and you're able to go back into those agencies and solve those problems, each and every one of them, as you move through. And sometimes it takes money to be able to do that. This, The prosperity that we're seeing in West Virginia right now started with the flatline budget, being able to manage that. And then when we, I, and I even said that if this is successful, Four or five years from now, we're going to be fighting over how to spend the money. That's exactly where we're at today. And that's a good place to be. Uh, But it's like drinking from a fire hose sometimes because you can have problems with the education system. You can have problems with the DHHR. You can have highway is not exactly the same, but we've transferred funds to the highway, $100 million, $130 million, $150 million, and $150 million. You add all those up, that went directly to the road fund from general revenue. That has never happened before. Never. You can add all the other years up in the state's history, and it doesn't come out to being $100 million. So you can see where by doing this and squeezing, because we've all heard the term, spend it or lose it mentality. The federal government is excellent at that. Well, it applies to government in general. If I had anything I could get get people to do, I would love for our counties and our cities to adopt the flatline budget. That way you're not cutting anything. What you're doing is allowing the revenues to grow and keeping your spending under control. And as you do that, you keep looking for efficiency after efficiency after efficiency. That's what we're doing in the legislature. And I would hope if Mike is elected governor that he would understand that aspect of it because it the proof's in the pudding. We're giving tax reductions, the largest tax reductions in the state's history. It's not like cutting 150 million, the food tax is gone. That was $150 million out of general revenue. It took 
what was it, eight years to phase that in? A ridiculous amount of time for $150 million. Uh, but what we're doing is getting it right for the people of West Virginia. Matt Miller. I know some are going to kind of push back a little bit as far as needs that are still in the state, not only what Mac Warner mentioned, but foster care, corrections that you guys have been working on in the legislature. Uh, where are kind of those issues, and, and how can some of these surpluses maybe help in those areas? Well, to, uh, I've We'll get to foster care in a second. Okay. I've got one that is not going to cost a nickel. They came to, well, let's just do that now. Uh, it's not going to cost a nickel. Fairmont State uh, came to me and said, we've got dorms, and we'd like to take 75 foster care children and move them in as a junior year in high school and be working with them on being able to take those students and then move them from their junior year to their senior year in a dorm environment, and they can be working on getting an associate degree or a certification also, so that when they graduate from high school that they're giving a leg up. And you know how much it's going to cost the state of West Virginia? Nothing. Nothing because you're able to transfer the federal dollars that goes into the foster care system, and you move that over to there. And if this works, we've got dormitories throughout the state uh, at different universities and other universities are saying, hey, we're interested in this also. And instead of dumping a kid out on the street when they come out of high school as a foster care student, we're, we're giving them a, an opportunity uh, to be lifted up and to be successful in life. And, and they deserve that. They deserve that in a big way. This is a prime example of the squeeze working in such a way that it makes it so that you think differently. Uh, when it comes to corrections, we just got done putting, I think it was $26 million additional into corrections. And some of that was base billed, some of it was not. Uh, and we did not have a flatline budget this year. We actually did some base building, but you can't hold a flatline budget forever. Uh, but I would like for us in the next year or so to get back to that if the conditions are right in an inflationary environment. Of makes it tough to be able to handle that flatline budget. But what it does more than anything, it is allows you to do capital expenditures. Uh, deferred maintenance is something that has been tremendous in this state, and that affected corrections as well. And we've been able to put hundreds of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance into our universities, in our school systems, and in our, our penal systems. At the same time, universities not getting as much money. Some issues at WVU that have been uh, very big here this year. Uh, thoughts on, on that and, and higher education funding? We've been working on getting more money to the universities, and how we did the higher education funding formula has changed in such a way that we're not going to pay for oceanography uh, in the state, uh, a degree in that from WVU. That, that, that's ridiculous. There are no oceanography jobs in the state of West Virginia. Uh, the, there is a whole host of things like that. And this isn't happening just at WVU or in just the state of West Virginia. It's happening throughout the country. The way people are going about learning and the, the degrees that they're getting is changing. And the student debt has a lot to do with that. Uh, nobody wants to take on a bunch of student debt. And somebody that has a certification for doing something like for Amazon, for doing the web services or uh, cybersecurity, things like that, yes, you can go to a standalone institution, but you can do a lot of this stuff online right now. Certifications are a big deal, but the world's changing around us, and we got to be able to adapt. I'll have to tip, give my... Uh, I tip my hat to Gordon Gee and Brad Smith and everybody else in the state of West Virginia. Shepherd University is doing the same thing. It's a lot more of uh, less prevalent, uh, but they're, they're they're putting it themselves in a position to be able long term beneficial to their students. I, Brad Smith is a good friend of mine. Uh, he used to be the CEO of Intuit. Uh, he is a brilliant man to begin with, but he set a goal so that within 10 years, when you graduate from Marshall University, you'll have a job and there won't be any student debt. Now, that is 
amazing. This is the way to rethink the learning process in the state of West Virginia. And our job is, is to make sure that we've got enough jobs in West Virginia so when we're graduating these students, our youth, that they still have job opportunities right here in the state of West Virginia. Fall in love, have families, and stay in the place so that we can grow our tax base so that we can continue doing the things that we've been doing over the last five, six, seven, eight years. It is a, a, a a holistic approach. I use that word frequently, being able to do this. But uh, Brad Smith, Gordon Gee, of uh, Eric Gage, uh, that's WVU State <clears throat> University. Uh, we've all been on a plane flying throughout the country of uh, Seattle, Silicon Valley, New York City, Washington, D.C., Denver, a meeting with corporate America. And uh, it went from where we were selling ourselves to where they are now asking. How can we participate in West Virginia? Because we are so bright. Can I tell another story, please? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I was with the lieutenant governors here a couple months, about a month ago. Because you are effectively the lieutenant governor of West Virginia. Right, and there's yeah. an association form. And I got invited to that, and I decided I was going to go. And I don't go to all these things because most of the time i got too much work in Charleston. But at this point, I was sitting at the table, and there was probably about 20 of them there. And they went down one side of them, and most of them were from states that are having problems. And they were boohooing what was going on. They got to me, and I started talking about West Virginia and all the good things that was happening, blah, 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 blah. And the very person, next person, the lady sitting to the right of me, uh, who was a lieutenant governor, said, I want to move to the state of West Virginia. <laughs> <clears throat> Corporate America was sitting in the audience and heard that. Yeah. Of, and so did, do we have warts? And, and still have problems in the state of West Virginia? Absolutely. But we're addressing them as we go through. But you had to get your priorities right. And one of the problems that we've had in the state of West Virginia is we've been dumping money, throwing money, actually, at public education for decades and decades and decades and getting the same result. While we lost our tax base, everybody here knows that we lost our tax base. You can see it right here in the Eastern Panhandle when Corning, GM, 3M, DuPont, they're all gone. And what happens was the tax style of the state. You can't do that. you got to be able to make yourself attractive enough to be able to have the tax base to be able to invest in yourselves. We have changed that dynamic, and we're not done. Uh, but you've got to be able to keep growing that tax base in such a way that you can invest in public education, into education. And by the way, we've done 5%, 5%, 5%, and... $2,350 plus a 21.25 percent reduction in your personal income tax and then there was some that, that came out of it because we're redoing PEIA and that still is a burden but it is got it's getting better I hope I got those numbers right because I didn't have those in front of me yeah you're right. but what but what we're what I'm trying to demonstrate is if you're a teacher state employee school service personnel over the last four or five years you've seen more investment into your paycheck than what's ever been done in that state's history. Are you doing another five this year, do you think? Uh, th th we're exploring that. Uh, I, I do not want to commit to that because I have not had to, to, uh, all decisions are made at 7 o'clock in the morning with our caucus. Mm -hmm. Okay, and went to, on the Senate side. Uh, and then to, to, uh, the governor's office, in fact, uh, Brian Abraham from the governor's office and the speaker and I will be meeting tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock. We do that every other week leading up to the session and when we hit december we start meeting every week sometimes twice a week being able to formulate our bills working together as a team for the people of west virginia and i'm sort of proud of it i'm the i'm sort of the hub i get everybody to the table i got a big conference room down there and we get the people in and have the discussions we're continuing discussions with the volunteer fire departments we're to con continuing discussions with education we're continuing discussions with the corrections making sure just because you think you fixed something doesn't mean that you have you got to keep your eye on the ball so you bring them back in and you find out how things are going and when you have the house of delegates and the senate and the governor's office working together as a team with those resources it pays dividends and again you it's pretty hard in west virginia not to see the benefits that are taking place and i, I really admit 
there's more that needs to be done. But you got to live within your budget to be able to get it and then stay focused on the prize. Let's talk about high school education, Craig. And uh, we have had recently interviews with the superintendent of schools, uh, board president and vice president. Absenteeism is a problem, not just in Berkeley County, but in schools throughout the state. I don't know how much... Uh, legislative oversight you possibly could even have that was voted down by the voters with the amendment series that failed this past time around. But we have to do something about getting kids in school because once they're in school, we can then educate them. But we can't if they're not there. Well, we're heading in the right direction, and that's why I brought up education. Amy Grady is the chair of education, and we're working with the uh, House and the governor's office to be able to put a plan. into. There's going to be an education package this year for public education and addressing it. That is a problem, and we recognize it. There's also a problem with the teachers being absent as well. Now, there's some teachers that show up, but the statistics – on that, which I do not have in front of me, so I'm not going to say them, uh, but they're astounding how many teachers that are have absence T problems also. So we got to look at this holistically. Again, I use the word too much, but we got to go in and see what's causing this and getting involved. If it was left up to Craig Blair and Craig Blair only, I would phase out the Promise Scholarship, and I would make it so that when you enter the school system, I'm talking about kindergarten and first grade, and as you're getting grades, if you're performing, then you get so much money goes into your account, and then it stays with you. Everybody's sitting at this table. When we work, we don't work unless we're getting the paycheck, right? Mm-hmm. Well, this is an investment on how to get the parents involved of in, into the education of their child. Now, keep in mind, the alternative education p- puts a cre- uh, competitive environment in place also for the public school system because before they didn't have that. Now that they're competing, they're, 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 it's going to rising tide lifts all boats, and this is going to happen. Education is going to get better in West Virginia. And we're going to invest in ourselves to be able to do that. And back to our universities. No, I got to cut you off because I I totally lost track of time. We have to get our last commercial break in here. And and Colin, I'm doing that without the bumper music. So go right ahead and and roll it. And and, uh, we've got a final second coming up after this.